Hi, my name is Zach McGee. I'm the chairman of New Media Legal Publishing, the sponsor of this CLE program. The presenter of this program is Andrew Struve. Andy was a brilliant, experienced, and highly successful litigator here in Southern California. On a personal level, he was also a warm, caring, and infectiously funny human being. Sadly, Andy passed away in July 2023 after a brief illness. The program you are about to watch was recorded a few years ago, but I've confirmed that the content still reflects the current state of the law on this topic. Reposting the program allows lawyers like you to continue to benefit from Andy's wisdom, and it allows those of us who knew Andy well to keep him around us for at least a little bit longer. I hope you enjoy it. Hello there, my name is Andrew Struve. I'm a trial lawyer here in Southern California, and I have the pleasure of being here today to cover one hour of continuing legal education on the subject of ethics. This is the actual second part of a um, program that uh, we also have a prior one hour presentation on. This hour that we're going to do now is in no manner dependent upon the first hour. You're free to do this one without ever having seen it and your lives will be fulfilled even despite not having seen the first one. I have been uh, an attendee at many ethics presentations over the years and I've given several. Uh, quite often they're boring. Uh, our hope is to use this particular medium as a way to actually uh, fulfill the ethics requirement and actually teach some valuable lessons or reaffirm things you already know by pointing to the careers of some people, some of whom are very well known, attorneys who are very well known and several who may not be. And I'll tell you their stories and then uh, I'll tell you what ultimately became of them. And there are written materials accompanying this, should your state require them. Uh, if you'd like, we have a score sheet or bingo card or whatever you'd like to call it. it lists about 20 or so uh, principles of ethical uh, conduct, requirements of ethical conduct by members of the bar uh, taken from the um, model code which is generally applicable in most jurisdictions. The principles certainly are universal. And so if you want to score this, uh, feel free to put a check mark or whatever you like in the column uh, referencing the appropriate person that will cover. I'm not presenting these stories in any particular chronological order. Some of them naturally go together. And so I have attempted to group them that way. Uh, a quick word about the selection process. Um, I have purposefully avoided presenting on anyone whose a conduct, the fact, underlying facts of which um, are still in doubt. I'm only going to talk to you about people where their responsibility has been presented and where a trier of fact has concluded the facts that I'll tell you to be true. Where anything involves speculation or rumor, I will call it out as such. I've also purposefully avoided selecting anybody whose cases are so recent as to be particularly painful or where they are uh, the subject of very recent news coverage because I think that sort of philosophically and for purposes of our present mission it's better to have the facts uh, fully baked and so that's um, what we'll be going over today. One last word, you'll notice that the um, lawyers whom we discussed today are overwhelmingly male. Uh, that is not due to any selection bias on my part it seems like the attorneys who have engaged in high profile conduct that has resulted in disciplinary action are for the most part male 
and I will leave it to the social scientists, including those of you in the audience, to make a determination about why that might be. It just happens to be the fact. All right, so with that, we'll start off, and we'll begin with two gentlemen simultaneously because both in terms of their accomplishments, and they were many, and in terms of their downfall, uh, they are inextricably linked. And these are Melvin or Mel Weiss and William Larocque, uh, two very, very well-known lawyers, particularly when uh, several decades ago when I was a young lawyer. Um, they were partners in a very prominent firm, Milberg Weiss, that was really the leading um, firm for private securities class actions. Uh, for those of you who don't practice in the area, the general construct is um, the suits would allege um, losses by investors uh, due to uh, statements or other conduct by insiders at a company that had resulted in the investors being misled. Uh, sometimes statements, of course, in the context of a 10b-5 violation can also be failures to disclose. All that would make the subject of a very nice law school class. But let's just say that the unifying theme of these private securities class actions um, was m investors being misled. And indeed, um, the problem was pervasive enough in the litigation really spearheaded by uh, these two gentlemen at Milberg Weiss led to uh, reforms in the um, structure of bringing such private securities law class actions. Um, Mr. Weiss is reported uh, and widely well known to have done frankly a tremendous amount of uh, good things for members of the uh, general public and for investors um, when he was ultimately um, sentenced and the facts of that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, the federal court received over 275 letters talking about Mr. Weiss's philanthropic history. Uh, among other things, pro bono, he recovered $6.25 billion in settlements for Holocaust victims. And uh, both the United States attorney and the federal judge hearing the case said that the support um, and, 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 and the letters of, um, uh, 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 about the good deeds of Mr. Weiss were uh, unprecedented in their experience. So Milberg Weiss recruited uh, plaintiffs to um, be um, plaintiffs in these securities cases. Uh, those of you with a passing familiarity, even from the first year of law school or federal courts, knows that you have to have constitutional uh, standing. And so you need a plaintiff who was actually injured by, um, by virtue of the, of the wrongful conduct. Uh, what brought down Mr. Weiss and Mr. LaRock subsequently was the fact that um, the firm was found to have paid kickbacks to plaintiffs to serve in the capacity uh, of plaintiffs on behalf of the, ca of the class. And these were uh, fairly substantial kickbacks. Sometimes the people receiving the kickbacks and uh, serving as plaintiff, at least in one instance, there was a reasonably prominent Los Angeles lawyer who uh, had such a role. Uh, in 2008, Mr. Weiss, having been indicted for this wrongful conduct, pled guilty, um, was given an 18 to 33 month uh, prison sentence, federal prison sentence, of which he served about half. He was ordered to pay $10 million in restitution. His partner also on the screen is then partner Bill LaRock, uh, had left Milberg Weiss um, and was practicing uh, similar fields of law in San Diego, California. He left Milberg Weiss in 2007. 
and uh, founded a spin-off firm, for lack of a better word. Uh, in the investigation of the kickbacks, um, Mr. Weiss was accused of being involved in the payment of them. And um, ultimately uh, was indicted in 2006 for the payment of kickbacks, wound up pleading guilty to a felony count of conspiracy to obstruct justice, and also making false statements under oath relating to his involvement when a partner at Milberg Weiss. And he thus was sentenced to uh, two years in federal prison a rather mild fine of $250,000 and um, substantial community service. As might be expected, his law license was uh, suspended uh, in 2008 during the course of the investigation in the criminal case, and he was uh, subsequently disbarred uh, from the practice of law in the uh, state of California. Uh, for the same payment of kickbacks to class plaintiffs. A unifying theme that you'll see in our discussion today is a lot of these high-profile people, uh, many of them, not all of them by any extent, but many of them did a substantial amount of good. Uh, many of them were extremely um, highly skilled, highly achieving people, extremely successful, and then ultimately were brought down by taking shortcuts or <clears throat> in a number of instances by what can only be described as their own financial needs. And um, others were driven purely by ideology. Uh, and, and, and you can make your own uh, determinations and value judgments about the comparative uh, moral wrongdoing, for lack of a better word, about these, these individuals. Which is sort of a segue to the next person I wanted to raise, uh, now deceased, a very well-known uh, criminal defense attorney in New York, Lynn Stewart. Uh, she had a uh, storied career uh, representing high-profile uh, criminal defendants, including a uh, member of the Weather Underground, um, a former Black Panther who had uh, hijacked a commercial flight, um, Sammy the Bull Gravano of the uh, well-known New York Gambino crime family. Stewart took the position that all of her clients shared the distinction of being revolutionaries operating against an unjust system or people whose cases were um, brought in an attempt to cover up um, or repay the defendants for the exposure of those injustices. Uh, she is on the record as stating a belief that violence at times was appropriate, is appropriate if she were still alive, uh, to redress injustice. She made it a point of drawing a distinction between anarchistic violence, uh, which she denounced, and targeted violence to address a specific perceived wrong, which she called directed violence. And she's on the record, uh, well documented, and take it as fact, as taking the position that directed violence, her term, was appropriate uh, when directed at institutions which, and this is a quote, perpetuate capitalism, racism, and sexism and at the people who are the appointed guardians of those institutions. And I'll end the quote there. Um, the circumstances leading to the discipline imposed against her relate to her defense of um, Sheikh uh, Omar Abdel Rahman, who was uh, one of the bombers in the first World Trade Center bombing back in 1993, um, referred to in popular media as the so-called blind sheik. 
the FBI had recorded Rahman as issuing a fatwa, a religious directive, encouraging acts of violence against U.S. civilian targets in the New York metro area. Those targets included the United Nations headquarters over by the East River, the uh, Holland and Lincoln tunnels, the two tunnels that connect the states of New York and New Jersey, George Washington Bridge, same thing but not a tunnel, and the FBI office in the Javits Center over on uh, New York's west side. And so um, Ms. Stewart came in to defend Sheikh Rahman, uh, Abdul Rahman, I should say, and uh, during his period of time in custody, um, including uh, representing him on post-conviction issues, uh, Sheikh Abdel Rahman was subject to what were called special administrative measures. Those govern communications between the Sheikh and his co-defendants on the one hand and their legal counsel. Uh, one of the conditions imposed, which was formally accepted by Stewart, was that in order to meet with Abdel Rahman in prison, she would not use their meetings or correspondence or telephone calls to pass messages between Abdel Rahman on the one hand and third party on the other hand. The purpose of these communications was designed, the purpose of these administrative measures, I should say, was designed to um, prevent, to the extent preventable, communications that could endanger U.S. national security or lead to further acts of um, violence and terrorism. Well, um, according to the indictment and ultimately the conviction upon which the indictment proceeded, uh, Stewart was accused of passing Rahman's blessings for a resumption of terrorist operations against the United States to various cell members in Egypt who had questioned uh, they wanted Rahman's input on whether they should abide by a ceasefire agreement with the Egyptian government. And apparently, um, Attorney uh, Stewart and others had tricked correctional officers into believing that conversations between Stewart and Rahman were routine, when in fact uh, Rahman was dictating statements to terrorists operating in Egypt. Uh, which were then passed along um, by Stewart. And uh, this resulted in an indictment and ultimate conviction of Attorney Stewart on charges of obstruction of justice and conspiracy to provide uh, material support to terrorism. Uh, supporters of Stewart had defended her communications uh, as part of an appropriate method to gain public awareness and support for Abdel Rahman's and his co-conspirators motives uh, that was not successful. Following conviction, the prosecution had sought to secure a 30-year sentence upon Ms. Stewart, um, but uh, that, was, that was not successful and in fact the United States judge at the sentencing recognized Stewart's long career of public service, uh, both to her clients and to the nation, sentenced her to 28 months in prison. Um, there was a resentencing that followed that lengthened the sentence. At the time that these proceedings were taking place, Ms. Stewart was uh, suffering from um, terminal cancer and um, unfortunately she passed in 2017 uh, and I'll leave it to your collective judgments again about the relative merits of um, passing along communications from an, a convicted uh, terrorist to members of terror cells uh, but what's beyond dispute is that um, regardless of what feelings one might have or have had about whether that was a legitimate um, thing morally to do. It's pretty indisputable. It was a violation of the special administrative measures uh, to which Ms. Stewart had agreed and which underlie 
underlay, I should say, the basis of her, of her criminal conviction. Our uh, next subject of discussion is a former prosecutor from North Carolina, Mike Nifong. And um, the circumstances that led to his ultimate removal as a district attorney for Durham County, North Carolina, and then um, his disbarment was his conduct as prosecutor in the infamous uh, Duke University lacrosse case, um, which was very much in the news for quite some period of time. Uh, in short version, in 2006, on behalf of Durham County, North Carolina, uh, Mike Nafong brought rape, sexual assault, and kidnapping charges against three white members of the uh, Duke University lacrosse team relating to alleged uh, sexual assault upon a black female who was reported to have been working in the sex trade. Um, there was a great deal of public coverage about this. Uh, I will leave you to uh, Wikipedia or similar sources to um, read up on that if you don't remember it and if you're so inclined. But uh, where Defong went wrong is that he was found to have purposefully conspired to withhold and withhold exculpatory DNA evidence from the defense. Um, for those of you who practice in criminal law or have a good rec recollection of your criminal procedure class from law school, you'll recall the case of Brady versus Maryland, which imposes upon a prosecutor an obligation to turn over any exculpatory evidence in their possession to the defense that was held in the Brady case to be a constitutional right of the defendant um, facing accusations of criminal conduct. For those of you who were asleep during criminal procedure, who don't practice criminal law and would prefer a different example, I will refer you to that classic American piece of cinematography, cinematography My Cousin Vinny, where uh, you will recall that Joe Pesci was defending his two young relatives in a um, capital case, as I recall, somewhere in the South. And uh, he went to cozy up to the uh, prosecutor and did so. And then he came back to his motel room and he uh, gleefully explained to uh, his girlfriend, Marissa Tomei, in the film that the prosecutor was such a great guy. And he said, sure, you know, you can look at my evidence. I'll you take it with you. Go ahead, look it over. And, and, and so uh, Pesci recounted to Tomei what a, what a great guy the prosecuting attorney was. And Tomei basically said, look, you idiot, they have to do that. It's the Brady case. Well, they, they do have to do that. And for present purposes, that's where, um, that's where Mike Nafong went wrong. The charges against the Duke students were ultimately dropped. I pass no judgment on their guilt or respective innocence. That's for others to determine, and I'm sure it's been spoken to fairly definitively. What is um, irrefutable is that a prosecutor first has a higher obligation of ethical standards than I would say an ordinary attorney, not meaning to denigrate anybody who's not a prosecutor, but they have a heightened standard of honesty and integrity. They represent the public. The case law and the codes are quite well settled on that point. And burying evidence for whatever purpose um, is, 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 not, um, is not to be done, and, and it's grounds for disbarment, and that's what resulted here. Uh, there were a great deal of later accusations about other misconduct by Nafong, many of which were disproven. I'm just going with what was proven here. And um, what was proven here was a conspiracy between District Attorney Mike Nafong and the DNA lab director to withhold exculpatory DNA evidence uh, from the defense team. And um, 
the list of prosecutorial abuses that were found by the North Carolina State Bar's disciplinary committee uh, were numerous. Um, and uh, Nafong ultimately agreed to sur surrender his law license and uh, not, to do, not to appeal um, the action against him. And through a statement that Nafong released through his attorney, uh, he said that disbarment was an appropriate punishment. Uh, one thing to take away from that is uh, when you're good and truly caught at something, whether it's for purposes of sentencing or in the hopes that someday you might be reinstated to the bar, or at least absent that for purposes of public opinion, the concept of acceptance of responsibility uh, means a lot to the adjudicatory authorities. And what you see here is a uh, good example of an attorney who did just that. Uh, our next um, lawyer for examination is Andrew Thomas. May not be as well known as some of the other people about whom we've spoken, um, but dovetails rather nicely with the uh, sad story of former District Attorney uh, Mike Nafong. Andrew Thomas uh, was county attorney for Maricopa County, Arizona from 2004 until 2010. And he took a very strong anti-immigrant position uh, while serving as county attorney. You um, may recall uh, the rather well-known, I'm not going to use words like infamous, that's a moral judgment, I will just leave it to you, the rather well-known uh, former sheriff of Maricopa County, Joe Arpaio. This is the guy that would uh, dress his prisoners up in pink underwear and stuff uh, to humiliate them and uh, keep them outside in the heat and various other things, and that's all well documented. Well, Andrew Thomas had a very similar anti-immigrant position. Uh, he ran in 2004 on a platform of seeking more severe sentences uh, for cases involving violence and illegal immigration. His uh, campaign signs uh, reflected his position. And then once he became county of attorney, uh, county attorney in Maricopa County, um, he brought a number of cases under Arizona's 2005 human smuggling law, where he would charge illegal immigrants collectively as co-conspirators uh, for smuggling themselves. Um, he uh, campaigned for a local proposition to deny bail to people who were charged with felonies who were illegally in the United States and um, was on the defense side of actions by the American Civil Liberties Union and others. Um, somewhat like Joe Arpaio at that time, um, county attorney uh, Thomas got himself into a dispute with other Arizona bodies, including particularly the Maricopa County uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, who, by the way, fund his office. And um, a number of lawsuits were brought uh, between those parties. And um, there were a number of indictments that were looked upon with disfavor by Maricopa County. And uh, there were investigations of the prosecutorial decision-making uh, of Mr. Thomas. And in 2010, um, there was a ruling issued by a special master, um, which concluded that while acting as county attorney, Thomas had um, abused his prosecutorial discretion, and that he had publicly and politically attempted to retaliate against the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, uh, that he tried to gain advantage politically by prosecuting, and I mean criminally prosecuting, political opponents, 
that his political alliance with Maricopa Sheriff uh, Joe Arpaio was a misuse of power. So that he, to paraphrase, he was using the prosecutorial power uh, to advance his own political interests, used it against his political enemies, and um, used it to uh, promote his um, version of social justice. And uh, not surprisingly, in 2008, the State Bar of Arizona got involved, launched an investigation um, following the ruling by the special master that we discussed earlier. Um, the State Bar brought its own investigator into the proceedings, and um, the Arizona Supreme Court concluded that Thomas should be disbarred. And in making that disbarment finding, uh, the Arizona Supreme Court cited conflicts of interest, dishonesty, misrepresentation, filing a frivolous lawsuit, filing of charges against county officials solely to embarrass or burden them, and then a deliberate conspiracy with others to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate a sitting Arizona judge. The um, state bar's probable cause order for the disbarment stated, and I quote, well, stated findings, and I quote, ethical violations by respondent as described by independent bar counsel are far reaching and enormous. Evidence thus far adduced portrays a reckless four year campaign of corruption and power abuse by respondent as a public official undertaken at enormous and mostly wasteful cost to taxpayers. Motivation for much of the alleged impropriety appears retaliatory, intended to do personal harm to the reputations of judges, county supervisors, and other county officials. And so the disbarment was, um, was uh, judge permanent um, in uh, 2012. And I will leave it to the uh, audience individually, and I will leave it to history collectively to make a determination about the social value or lack thereof of the, um, of the uh, positions which this county attorney espoused, um, what ultimately brought him down on disciplinary basis was the methods by which he um, executed his promotion of those goals, uh, which takes us in a rather nice segue to our next contestant, um, former attorney Jack Thompson of Coral Gables, Florida. Uh, Jack Thompson attained a national reputation as a crusader against video game violence. He, by all accounts, sincerely and strongly believed that video games uh, promoted violence in youth. Uh, his argument was that violent video games were, to use his phrase, murder simulators. And he pointed to, to alleged connections between violent video games <clears throat> and a uh, number of school shootings. He also supported legislation in a number of states to ban or otherwise restrict violent video games and was extremely outspoken on this subject and I see no evidence to suggest that his beliefs in this regard were not sincerely held. However, it was other conduct on his part coupled with the way he promoted his very high profile position on this violence in video gaming, uh, which, led, um, which led to his uh, disbarment. Now, 
And Thompson's story would not be complete without referencing some other points in his legal, legal career. Um, when later Attorney General Janet Reno was the Dade County State Attorney, she declined to prosecute an uh, individual whom Thompson believed should have been prosecuted. And uh, Thompson's response was to present Reno with a letter at a campaign event of hers asking her to check boxes to indicate whether she was homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual. Uh, and then he tormented her um, similarly to follow that. Uh, he got in a number of disputes with the bar when the bar started looking at his overall conduct of litigation. Uh, he then turned on the bar itself, uh, which I would recommend um, one does not do if one wishes to continue as a member of the bar. Universally, in cases that I've seen in this regard, the uh, bar tends to take that rather personally. Well, in 93, he asked a Florida judge to declare the State Bar of Florida unconstitutional. Uh, in his suit, he alleged the Florida Bar had uh, engaged in a vendetta against him uh, because of his religious beliefs. His contention in the lawsuit was that the religious beliefs that he held conflicted with the bar's pro-gay, humanist, and liberal agenda. Uh, he sued them later, accusing them of harassing him by investigating complaints against him. That was another non-starter. Uh, he accused a sitting judge of distribution of pornography to children. I uh, claimed a judge presiding over a then pending case broke the rules, even state bar rules, because he thought because he thinks the rules don't apply to him. He accused the judge of knowingly participating in facilitating criminal distribution of sexual material to minors, and many things of that effect. The Florida bar, during the course of this um, tussle, is, is an understatement during the course of this repeated, um, protracted uh, examination. I'm trying to be level and charitable in my commentary. Examination of Thompson's conduct uh, put in place um, essentially a vexatious litigant type of requirement except generally as the audience probably knows the vexatious litigant statutes um, in most jurisdictions can only be invoked against non-attorneys. Well, in this case, what was put in place was a requirement that anything that, um, that uh, Thompson would file in the future with a court had to be also signed by another attorney. You can sort of see why they'd require that. They wanted somebody else to uh, put their own name on anything that Thompson submitted. Uh, so. It goes without saying that these things would constitute actionable misconduct, but um, just by way of example, uh, he accused a court in writing of inability to comprehend his arguments. Uh, he filed a motion which he called a picture book for adults that had images of swastikas, kangaroos in court, cartoon squirrels, Paul Simon, Paul Newman, Ray Charles, a handprint with the word slap underneath it, Jack Nicholson, Julius Caesar, monkeys, and a house of cards. I don't know what the page limit was on that motion, but it sounds like it was pretty full. 2008 uh, recommendation that Thompson be disbarred, uh, which he was uh, in early 2009. As a sort of bookend to the concept of exhibiting remorse, following his disbarment, Thompson announced that he never intended to resume practicing law, so he would not seek reinstatement, but he also claimed, he didn't use the word reinstatement, 
because he publicly claimed he was never disbarred because all the orders resulting in his disbarment were legal nullities based on his arguments about the constitutionality of the state bar and his own perception about his own rights. And I don't think further requirements uh, or further explanation is necessary about attorney, former attorney Thompson. I'll leave it at that. We'll now turn away from Mr. Thompson and turn to somebody known to all, but the fact that he was disbarred might be um, quite a bit less well known. And uh, on your screen right now should be attorney F. Lee Bailey, uh, one of the most famous um, criminal defense attorneys in the United States for a number of decades. Um, one would often colloquially hear people say, well, he's no F. Lee Bailey. Um, sort of the last public swan song that we all saw from Mr. Bailey was uh, and joining the cast of characters on the so-called Dream Team in the defense of the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, I have no personal knowledge. It was somewhat alluded to that Bailey's presence on that defense team was an attempt to re-inject himself into the public discourse, perhaps to breathe new life into a flagging career that he uh, took um, discounted uh, fees as a result of doing that. Who knows? Who cares? Um, Bailey did have a truly storied career. You know, he graduated undergrad at Boston University with the highest GPA in the school's history. And he graduated uh, with a doctorate of laws from BU uh, first in his class. Um, he was involved in the Patty Hearst case. Um, and he was successful in protecting Patty Hearst from uh, death penalty um, enhancements. Uh, Patty Hearst, of course, and her history with the Symbionese Liberation Army and the bank robberies in which uh, she became a participant for whatever reason are both known to history and well documented. And I'll leave that to your to your private reading, but in any event, Bailey, uh, it's established as fact, was able to negotiate an agreement um, with um, Hearst to cooperate with prosecutors about a bank robbery that had taken place in exchange for an agreement not to seek the uh, death penalty. So what did in Bailey? What did in Bailey was likely something nobody's ever heard of here, if you have, congratulations. but. During the same time that the O.J. Simpson criminal case was taking place, you'll remember another member of the Simpson Dream Team was a Los Angeles lawyer named Robert Shapiro. Well, during the pendency of the O.J. case, both F. Lee Bailey and Robert Shapiro represented an accused marijuana dealer named Claude Dubach. And uh, Dubach ultimately reached, while represented by Bailey, a plea agreement with the government that re required Dubach to surrender his assets to the federal government, which assets included a large block of stock in a company called Biochem, uh, which was valued at $6 million at the time that it was surrendered. Um, to be turned over to the government. I will leave this to your own uh, suppositions and curiosity about how some uh, accused drug dealers seem to have had more sophisticated investment strategies than others. Um, let's just say the stock is established as having been worth six million dollars at the time it was turned over. During the period of time that F. Lee Bailey held the stock um, received from Dubach and worth, again, as we said, $6 million at the time that Bailey received it, uh, Bailey um, worked at securing the terms of the ultimate um, disposition of the criminal charges pending against Dubach. And by the time that had occurred, 
Uh, it was time for Bailey to uh, turn over the stock to the U.S. government. At that point, it had uh, appreciated to have a market value of $20 million. So I'll refer you back to my comment about sophisticated investment strategies. That sounds like a pretty good stock. Trouble was, Bailey at that time refused to turn over the stock to the U.S. government in full. Uh, he claimed that he was entitled to a lien on the $14 million in the appreciated value of the stock uh, for his legal fees. Um, Bailey also uh, said he had used the um, stock as collateral for loans and hence was unable to turn it over to the federal government if he wished to do so. Now, that poses a problem. I'll refer you back to your professional responsibility classes in law school. Uh, because if this was indeed the property of a third party, in this case either Dubak or more likely the federal government, uh, one should not be using it as collateral for anything. It's, uh, it's, it's client property. And um, so he barely refused to turn over the stock. He was imprisoned for six weeks. Uh, for contempt of court. Bailey's brother during those six weeks managed to raise the money to secure F. Lee Bailey's release, uh, but the Florida Supreme Court uh, found him guilty of seven counts of attorney misconduct and uh, had disbarred him in 2001. And two years later in 2003, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, separately disbarred him over the stock uh, refusal to turn over and his treatment of it. Uh, what's somewhat interesting was that approximately four years later, Bailey tried to regain his Massachusetts law license and really litigated the issue pretty strongly through several different proceedings. Uh, ultimately, the, the uh, Board of Bar Examiners in the state of Maine, another state that had disbarred him, uh, voted five to four to deny his application um, for reinstatement. Uh, when seeking reinstatement, at least in Maine, the applicant bears the burden of establishing that they have the requisite honesty and integrity to practice law. And the court found that Bailey had come very close to reestablishing his suitability to practice law, except he still had an unsatisfied $2 million tax debt, which he'd not paid. And so his application for reinstatement was denied on that basis. Um, but there was a great deal of debate. A subsequent proceeding found that the existence of an unpaid and overdue debt is not necessarily indicia of an inability to practice law. Absent other misconduct concerning the non-repayment of that debt. Well, to the extent that might have been F. Lee Bailey's path back to the practice of law, uh, the main board of bar examiners appealed that determination to the entire Supreme Court of the state of Maine, uh, which sided with the bar examiners and continued to prevent Bailey from practicing law. So to my knowledge, to the current date, uh, he still holds no license to practice. Once again, an example of um, somebody who had a obviously very storied career uh, being undone by um, an ethical violation that really would otherwise be a footnote to that career um, but for the findings of um, a misuse of client funds, frankly, and a failure to obey court orders relating to them. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that F. Lee Bailey's lifetime career, love him or hate him, entirely up to you, was not a career of decades of really obnoxious behavior, for lack of a better term, like we've seen in some of the other people who's careers we've examined today. Uh, next up in our list of uh, folks to discuss, we have Ed Fagan, a former lawyer from the state of New York. Uh, Mr. Fagan began uh, his career in New York, unsurprisingly, uh, working as a personal injury lawyer. 
He then worked a large law firm uh, on corporate type matters. Uh, and then he started some side businesses and a nonprofit entity. But then suddenly in 1995, he really hit the big time. And at the time that he did hit the big time, he had a number of personal injury clients with ongoing cases. We'll talk about them later. But in 1995, he began filing lawsuits against Swiss banks on behalf of Holocaust survivors. Essentially, uh, what these suits alleged, and they're a fascinating topic that I'll leave you to further reading on your own if you like. I do recommend the subject. The allegations were essentially that the banks held funds that had been improperly confiscated uh, by the German government during World War II and never repaid to the rightful owners of those funds. And uh, these suits that Fagan was a part of against uh, the Swiss banks resulted in a payout of approximately one and a quarter billion dollars. And he had a contingency arrangement on these cases. Uh, during the course of resolving these, it's alleged, it was not proven, but it's alleged that he held up, the, that Fagan held up the signing of the ultimate settlements because he was haggling, uh, attempting to allocate more money to himself to increase the share of legal fees uh, played to himself, paid to himself, I should say. He got in a number of disagreements uh, with his co-plaintiff counsel on these cases uh, who criticized him in the press, uh, essentially saying that Fagan didn't participate in any of the hard work, any of the legal theories, any of the complexities. He was just uh, representing himself, frankly, and self-promoting and um, was basically in it for Fagan and no one else. Uh, his own clients, some of them at least, believed this. Uh, one of the named plaintiffs in a lawsuit against the banks opted out of the settlement because she felt that her attorneys were representing themselves and not her. And she brought an ethics complaint in the New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division. That's the intermediate appellate court in the um, state of New York. Well, what did Mr. Fagan in was the fact that while he was busy in the press and allegedly promoting himself, and certainly while he was busy on these highly lucrative Swiss bank cases, he had a number of ongoing personal injury actions uh, that he did not prosecute. And he was accused of abandoning his clients in favor of devoting his time to the um, Holocaust reparations cases. For example, he had a personal injury client uh, who claimed he was abandoned. This gentleman brought a malpractice suit against Fagan and won a 3.2 million malpractice award. Uh, you know, keep in mind, a legal mal claim requires you to prove uh, for two things, essentially. One, first, that the conduct of the lawyer fell below the standard of care of a reasonable lawyer acting in a similar capacity. That's, that's rounding off, but that's essentially the law. And second, that but for the alleged malpractice, the result would have been different. So you actually have to show the merit of the underlying case that was messed up by the lawyer's malpractice. Um, one can imagine, I have no evidence, that the $3.2 million was, client, was uh, insurer funds. The insurer must have, been, uh, must have been convinced. And it goes on and on. Uh, other disabled claimants who were grievously injured, clients of Mr. Fagan's whose cases he failed to prosecute. And uh, this led to, to uh, disbarment proceedings in 2008. Mr. Fagan was disbarred in the state of New York. You can't favor one group of clients over another group of clients, and you certainly can't ignore and abandon clients, and that's what the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court concluded that Fagan had done. Our last subject for today's examination is an interesting one, not so much for what occurred, but procedurally how it played out. And uh, the gentleman on your screen right now is a former United States District Judge for the Eastern District of Louisiana, Gabriel Thomas Porteous, Jr. 
Uh, he was a sitting federal judge, uh, nominated and confirmed in 1994, nominated by President Clinton. And um, he issued some thoughtful and well-reasoned opinions by all accounts during his time as a federal judge. Unfortunately, as the facts later demonstrated, uh, he had close ties with the local bail bondsman and uh, ca got caught up, Porsches did, in um, a pattern of conduct that was proven of taking cash bribes and uh, non-cash bribes from um, lawyers appearing in litigation before him. Uh, there was also a finding by the Judicial Conference of the United States expressing a determination that Judge Porteous had repeatedly committed perjury by signing false disclosure forms under oath and that uh, Porteous had filed a bankruptcy, which allowed him to obtain discharge of his debts while continuing his lifestyle at the expense of his creditors, and that he lied on a bank application with intent to defraud the bank in order to secure a loan. And what's interesting about Judge Porteous is not so much the underlying, uh, the underlying um, events of bribery, unfortunately, it occurs um, with sad consistency over the decades, including even with federal judges. What's interesting is that uh, Judge Porteous was impeached following the Judicial Council's recommendation. Uh, he was impeached by the United States House of Representatives. And then he was tried in December of 2010 by the Senate. And during the Senate trial, Judge Porteous announced that he was planning to leave the federal bench and would resign and step down uh, if he wasn't removed from office. This was seemingly an attempt to avoid conviction in the Senate by voluntarily leaving office. There is some history of that. There's some present day relevancy uh, to various things occurring in our current times regarding Senate trials and House impeachments. In any event, uh, Judge Porteous announced that he would voluntarily leave the bench if he wasn't removed. Well, the Senate tried and convicted and removed him anyways. And um, this was an honest services conviction. Uh, those of you who practice in the criminal law, especially in white collar, will understand the basis of an honest services violation. It's that by engaging in misconduct while being paid by the federal government or by a federal government program, you have deprived the United States of the honest services that you were required to provide. Um, again, the Senate convicted Judge Porteous. Uh, and he is forever barred from holding any other federal office. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to spend this hour. I think the lessons that we've talked about here, I may have hinted at some of the takeaways along the way. I think they're obvious and can be drawn for themselves. And I appreciate your time very much.